this morning we're going to be in Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Um, so this, uh, this sermon is, is both kind of a follow-up and a, and a precursor. Uh, if you've been with us for some time, the last couple times uh, I have preached, I've been preaching kind of through some of the different themes that have been found in Ephesians. Um, that was really, I've done a couple sermons over the course of last year, and uh, this just kind of happens to be where, we, uh, where I kind of left off there. Now, if you give it a couple weeks, we'll actually be teaching through uh, verse by verse through the book of Ephesians. So I hope that uh, uh, what is... Uh, what what I present today is, is something that just kind of gets you excited to, to really dive into this book uh, more fully, um, which is something we will be doing here in the, the weeks and months to come. But uh, as we get into this, one thing I want to um, encourage you is to be continually molded by, uh, by God's Word um, and to remind you that it is a blessing to be molded by it. Um, there, there's many times that we uh, tend to absorb ideas and beliefs um, from the culture, from the world around us, uh, and, and we do that without even re- realizing it. And then, you know, when we, when we come to the scripture and we say, okay, well, hang on a second, that's, do I really believe that? Um, so, so I just want to encourage you um, from Romans 12, 2, that says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's Romans 12, 2. I want us to be conscious of that as we dive into uh, the text this morning. Um, and again, I, I point that out because many of the many of the truths that we're looking at today here in Ephesians are things that are um, very contrary to what's believed by uh, the culture by and large today, and uh, and some of them even by large um, swaths of of professing Christians. Um, so again, we're in Ephesians here. I realize it's been a couple months, so I'm going to kind of overview some of the some of the themes that we've looked at. Hopefully, kind of get us on the same page here. Um, but the book of Ephesians is uh, is a very short but a very thick book. Um, it's called by many the 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 richest uh, the richest theology uh, of the Bible. That is, it's it's one of those where you could almost do you know several sermons on each verse. You know, sometimes they're they're just so packed and so uh, so loaded. Um, but uh, it's, it's written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians in the church in Ephesus. Um, and it's certainly something that is applicable to us just sort of by extension. Um, we're, we're obviously not this particular group of Christians in this particular place, um, but it's written to, uh, to the church. It's written to believers uh, at all times in all, in all places by extension. Um, but just kind of by way of overview, as we, as we look through Ephesians, um, it starts with really giving a divine perspective of salvation. Um, the, the, the first uh, 14 or so verses especially look at, look at salvation, and they look from a divine perspective. Um, and a divine perspective rather than sort of a human perspective. Um, I think commonly as we think about uh, salvation, we will tend to look primarily at conversion um, which is which is certainly one element of salvation. Conversion being, um, you know, if, if we were to ask most of you about your your testimony, you might say, uh, you know, I went to a, a church or I had this friend that shared the gospel with me, and I, you know, sort of I, I recognized my need for a savior. I recognized what Christ had done on the cross, and I, um, you know, repented and believed. Right? I, I cried out to Christ in faith. Um, and yes, and amen to that. That's uh, primarily sort of a, a human perspective of, uh, of salvation. That is the, the element of conversion. Um, what Paul's kind of looking at, though, is as we get into Ephesians, is he's looking from a uh, divine perspective. We're seeing that there's more that's going on there. We see uh, in uh, verses 4 and 5, we see that Christ was the one who chose us before the foundation of the world, um, that we should be holy and blameless before him. It says, uh, in love, he, he predestined us to adoption, to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, all according to the, the counsel of his will. This is all uh, in, in uh, the first chapter of Ephesians. Uh, so it, it's important as we think about salvation to recognize that these things are not contrary to each other, to say um, that Scripture speaks of the divine perspective, of the eternal perspective of salvation, uh, is not to say that the Bible doesn't also speak of the sort of the, the human element of it, where we, uh, we recognize our need for a Savior, we turn to Christ in faith. Both of these things are taught, they're just different elements. And depending on where we are in Scripture, sometimes we'll see one very clearly and other times we'll see the other. It's important to recognize that Scripture says both. Uh, it's bigger than, than just either of those things individually. These things are, are complementary, not contradictory. 
Um, and this, is, this, I think, challenges much, uh, much modern thinking, even, even in the Christian church, that sees salvation primarily as, uh, as conversion. Um, certainly, conversion is included in salvation, but salvation is bigger than that. So just as uh, kind of a word of warning, not to truncate salvation to only uh, this sort of conversion experience. Uh, salvation is something that is, that is really all-encompassing of the Christian life. From the time we're saved, God is sanctifying us. He's purifying us. He is, he is growing us. This is, the Bible speaks of this also as salvation. Um, it's a process. But uh, one of the, the first things that we looked at as we, as we studied Ephesians was uh, we really asked the question of what does it mean to be in Christ? Um, frequently, uh, dozens of times, in fact, in the New Testament, it will speak of us as being in Christ. It will speak to those who are in Christ. So really, we dug into what, what does it mean to be in Christ? Um, what does it mean to be in Christ? And, and we saw that that is to be identified with Christ. It is to be united uh, to Christ, to be an extension of Christ, kind of in a, the, the biblical analogy that we gave, or that Jesus gave, was the vine and the branches. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. There's, there's an idea there that we are connected. We flow from Christ. We are one with Christ. Now, not, not one with Christ in sort of a, a, a pagan, um, you know, pantheistic or, or panentheistic way, not, not in that sort of a way, but again, in a way that um, the, the vine and the branches are, are one. They are, they are connected. And we see uh, over and over again, especially in Ephesians chapter 1, we see all these things that are true of those who are in Christ. Um, those who are in Christ are those who were chosen before the world's foundation. We were seated with Christ in heavenly places. We await an eternal inheritance. We are united to Christ. We are identified with Christ. And it's, it's through this identification with Christ that is really the basis for our forgiveness. It's the source of our right standing with God. We're not, we're not saved. We're not righteous because of something we've done. We are righteous because we are united to the one who is righteous. And that is then imputed to us. And that's, that's the foundation, is that we are, we are found to be in Christ. We are yoked to Christ. In, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, kind of moving past this, we looked at really the, the, the biggest thing I think that we looked at that time was the contrast between the you were dead and the four by grace. Um, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul continues uh, teaching on this, this theme of salvation. And... Um, this is something that, that really challenges, I think, again, a lot of, a lot of modern thinking. We, we tend to think of, of kind of everyone as, you know, sort of pretty good people. Maybe we've lost our way or, or something like that. But we're, we're really pretty good, but that's certainly not what Scripture says. Uh, as we look at Ephesians 2, it starts out saying, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And then it goes on saying we were following the course of the world. We were following the devil. We were following the, the sinful desires of our flesh, things like that. That is the state that we were saved out of. We weren't, uh, we weren't even neutral. We were hostile, in fact, towards God, towards the things of God. That was the you were dead. This is the picture that it, that it paints of humanity, but then comes the for by grace, um, or the, the but now, but God. Um, so it, it speaks of this, this very, um, very challenging view of, of humanity, but it's, it's out of that that we see the goodness and the power of God's grace, God's saving grace, God's drawing grace. And it's, of course, not just in Ephesians. We see uh, the, the, these other themes uh, spread out throughout Scripture. We see uh, Romans 1 saying that we we're willingly, openly rebelling against God. Uh, Ephesians 2 says we were dead in sin. Uh, Romans 6 says we were slaves to sin. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2 says we were unable to understand the things of God. This is the picture that, that Scripture paints of humanity apart from Christ. And it's, again, it's out of this bleak picture of humanity that comes the, uh, the four by grace. It's, the, it's God's grace that, that transforms us, us who were running from God to now running towards God. It's, it's this four by grace. It's God's grace that causes us who were enemies to be reconciled. It causes uh, those who were unable to understand the things of God to now be proclaiming uh, the things of God. One other thing that this, uh, that this kind of challenges is uh, I think this sort of idea that really I think has crept into the church a lot, and it's, but most people might not say this outright, but we sort of have this idea that we're saved primarily so that we can go to heaven. 
Um, as, if, as if that's kind of the goal. It's like, okay, if we convert to Christ, then, then we get to go to heaven, which is true. That's not, that's not untrue, but that's not, Scripture doesn't speak of that as being the primary point. God saved us in order to do things for him. You can see that in Ephesians 2.10 in, in particular, that there's specific works that God prepared for us to do for him. Um, and that's one of the reasons why he saved us. He saved us to do work for him, to build his kingdom, to, to love those who hate us, to care for those in need, to train our children in the way God's commanded, um, th things like that. We're, we're saved for things, not just so we can sort of escape and, and be with him uh, in heaven. We are saved in order to work and carry out God's will on earth until Christ returns. Um, I know this was kind of, a, kind of a long introduction before we even got into the text today, but um, I think it's important not only because it's been a while since, uh, since we've taught on this, but the other thing is that the, the passage that we're going to start with today starts with a therefore. Um, so you have to, uh, you know, it, it harkens back to the things that Paul has just gotten done talking. So I hope that that overview uh, was helpful. Um, I'll ask you now if you're able to stand um, and we will, uh, we will read the scripture passage this morning. Again, this is out of Ephesians chapter 2. Um, after I conclude reading it, I'll say, this is the word of the Lord. Please respond with thanks be to God. <laughs> Ephesians 2, starting in verse 11, says, Therefore remember that at one time you, Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man, in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near, for through him we have access to one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God." built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, Father, I thank, you. Um, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for uh, just your church. I thank you for uh, the celebration of the Lord's Supper that you gave us. What a, what a beautiful reminder that is of, of who you are and who we are in you. Lord, we need your help. We need your grace. Lord, there are many here who are, who are weary. Lord, I'm weary. Um, Lord, this is, uh, this is a difficult time for many. Um, Lord, we are, we are very aware in times of struggle of, of how, how hungry we are for your grace. Lord, we are hungry for your word. Father, I, I ask that you would just pour your grace out on us, um, that you would satisfy our, our hungry souls, Lord, satisfy us with your word. Father, I pray that you would, uh, that you would guard my tongue uh, this morning, that I would preach truthfully in a way that honors you. Lord, I pray that, um, that this would be uh, a time of encouragement um, and a time of hope in you. Lord, it's in your name and for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11 here. Again, I warned you, it starts with a therefore. Therefore, remember that at one time... You, Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. 
Um, so the circumcision is, is kind of an interesting theme in Scripture, and that's one of the reasons that we, we like to go back and forth between the Old Testament and the New Testament is to sort of pick up on some of this. If you're uh, unfamiliar with the Old Testament and then you just kind of jump in here, uh, this, this can be a little, a little strange and, and a little bit confusing sometimes. But um, we see throughout the Old Testament that um, circumcision is the, the sign or the seal of the covenant. If you remember back to uh, early on in, in Genesis, God comes down to Abraham and he promises Abraham all of these wonderful things. He makes a covenant with him. Um, he says, I'm going to give you this and that. I'm going to give you offspring. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to give you this land. I will be your God and you will be my people. Um, and he then says, as a sign to you, circumcise your, uh, your sons. Um, and this is, this is kind of repeated a number of times in, uh, in Genesis um, we see it, uh, Genesis 17 is one of the particular uh, times that, that comes, uh, comes into play here. Um, he says, every, God says, every male among you shall be circumcised. You should be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Uh, so it's, it's something that Abraham and Abraham's descendants were, some, it was something they were commanded to do. It was to be a sign to them, something for them to look at to remember who God is and what God had done. Uh, it was something that throughout sort of the history of the, the Old Testament people of God, it was something that would really become the uh, identity marker of, uh, of Israel. And it was also something that had severe consequences if someone would neglect. Um, and uh, even in sort of the, the ancient Jewish context, um, if you refer to someone as being uncircumcised, that's kind of a, it's a derogatory term. Um, we think of uh, David before he fought Goliath said, who is this? uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God. So it was some, something that was sort of a jab. It was to be uncircumcised was to be thought of as being, being dirty, being unclean, being outside the people of God. Um, but in the Old Testament, sometimes it's, it's easy for us to think that the Old Testament is just, is just all physical, um, and the New Testament is sort of spiritual, but that, that's not the case. There's almost always elements of, of both, uh, in both Old and New Testament, um, I would urge you to consider uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10 here. This is talking about how uh, circumcision is something more than just a physical act. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says, Circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. Uh, so this is something that's referring to a change of heart, not just a physical action that we do. Um, Jeremiah 4, 4 likewise says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, remove the foreskin of your hearts. Uh, so again, we see here that the call to, uh, to circumcision is a call to repentance. And this is, this is kind of what, what Paul is, is, is to some degree alluding to as we get into Ephesians here. Um, Paul calls it, he says, um, let's see, the, called the uncircumcision by what is, called the uncircum, what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Um, so he's referring to this, this physical act, this thing that is done by human hands. Uh, but again, circumcision has always been more than just a physical act. It's not just the removal of some skin. It's intended to point toward the inward reality um, that that which is fleshly of us has been cut off. Um, we can look, there's, there's a couple parallel passages that, uh, that deal with this. In the New Testament, we have uh, Colossians 2.11 says this, it says, in him, in Christ, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Uh, likewise, Romans 2.29 says, A Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a, matter of the heart, is a matter of the heart by the spirit and not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So we see again here that, that really the, the theme here is that circumcision is of the heart. It's about salvation. It's referring to uh, repentance. And Paul here in, in Ephesians chapter 2 is saying, he's kind of painting this picture of us. This was us. Uh, this was us. We were the ones who were outside of God's promises. We were the ones who were outside of, of God's covenant. Remember, verse 12, that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So, again here, this is, this is continuing this sort of bleak picture of our natural state, our default state. Um, 
I, I think a lot of Christians have, have sort of absorbed, um, this, this is another one, I think a lot of Christians have absorbed this sort of worldly thinking that, that says that every, every person is a child of God. And of course, in a, in a creative sense, that's true, right? God is the creator and he created us, so that there is a sense in which God is all of our father, but that, that's really, um, that, that's not the way the Bible speaks of this. Um, that's not the way the Bible speaks of these things. Scripture is very clear in a number of places that apart from God's grace, apart from salvation, apart from personal faith in Christ, we are not God's children. Uh, Jesus himself said it very clearly in John 8. He said um, to those who were, who were harassing him at that time, uh, verse 39, he said, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. And then he goes on to say, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. So, so Christ is very clear here that not, not everyone is just by default a child of God. Um, and beyond this, we can gather from all this that whether one is a child of God is, um, is something that's ultimately going to be demonstrated by their actions, by their lives, things like that. So um, what's true of those who are not God's children, again, among whom we all were uh, of, of this group? Uh, just, just looking at these couple, these couple sentences here, it says that we were strangers to the promises, we were alienated from God's people, we were without hope, and we were without God. Again, this is what is true of every one of us here at one point in time. Thanks be to God, that's not the end of the passage. Uh, ver verse 13 really kind of changes, changes the tune here. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Brought near by the blood of Christ. I, one thing that I, I really want to hammer as we, as we look at this here is that the blood of Christ actually saves. The blood of Christ actually accomplishes that which, is, which it was set out to do. Uh, another thing that I think is very common in much of evangelicalism today is to see Christ's blood as really just something that's sort of a, that, that's a potential. Um, it's something that it doesn't, it may or may not actually accomplish what it was set out to do, but it was kind of, you know, Jesus bled and died and okay, here's this thing out there. Um, and it, it may or may not have uh, whatever co given consequences depending on, you know, human, human will and things like that. Um, but th this is quite clear that what the blood of Christ is doing here is it is bringing us near. It is bringing believers to God. And, uh, and, and this is a theme that, again, none of this stuff we find just in Ephesians. We find this um, all, throughout, all throughout scriptures, but uh, three passages that I do want to also point to um, that, that deal with uh, the effectual nature of the blood of Christ uh, would be, uh, first of all, even just going back a chapter in Ephesians to verse 7, says, uh, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins in, according, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Colossians 1.20 parallels this. It says that Christ made peace through his blood shed on the cross. Revelation 1.5 says that Christ has freed us from our sins by his blood. So we see here in all these that Christ's blood is not spoken of as just a mere potential. It's actually something that accomplishes that which it is intended to do. So looking at Backing up a little bit and just looking at verses 11 through uh, 13 here, this is what this is really referring to is the Gentile inclusion uh, of God's people. Um, again, this is a group of people whom we all were, we all once were. We were outside of uh, God's people, outside of the promises, things like that. But because of the blood of Christ, we're brought in, we're brought near. This is something that Christ has accomplished. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Uh, verse 14 there is, is profound. For he himself is our peace. Um, that, that's always, when we come to Scripture, one of the first things that we should look for. What does this say about God? What does this say about the nature, the character, the attributes of God? God is our peace. And as we, we continue on this passage, we'll see that this, this peace with God, God who is our peace, this peace with God, uh, this peace with God flows to the peace of God, which is a fruit of the Spirit. We, that was one of the things we went over this last Wednesday night as we looked at um, some of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is something that God does, but it's something that flows downstream. It's something that flows from uh, having peace with God. Romans, uh, in particular, speaks much of us being you know, once at war with God, now at peace with God, no longer at enmity. Uh, we are at peace with God. And then that peace then uh, flows 
to us as the, the gift of the Spirit, um, the peace of God. It flows to our relationships with those around us, peace with others. The blood of Christ is something that changes our relationship with God. Uh, we who were at enmity with God are now at peace with God. And it says that this then made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Uh, so we see this, uh, this unity that comes in here amidst this Jewish-Gentile distinction. Uh, we see this as, as Christ redeeming creation. We see uh, a new humanity being built in Christ. Uh, John 10, 14 and through 16, Jesus says this. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Of course, there he's speaking of of the nations, of the, the non-Jewish world. Um, as we look at uh, sort of the, the history of the church, you know, initially it was primarily Jewish, uh, Jewish people who were the early Christians. Um, and then as we see, especially in the book of Acts, we see kind of this transition of um, just this gospel mission to the nations, to the Gentiles. That was God bringing them in, including them. That was uh, Christ going and getting the sheep who were from other folds and unifying us into one people. Jesus acknowledges that there is, and Paul likewise acknowledges, that there is some distinction uh, between Jews and Gentiles, but in him, in Christ, there is unity amid that distinction. And uh, again, speaking of, of the Gentile inclusion, speaking of people from every tribe and tongue and age who are being brought near to Christ, who are being gathered together as one people, as one body, uh, killing the hostility between, uh, especially back then, Jews and Gentiles. There was much, much hostility between those two groups. So how much more then should this, um, this unity kill the hostility between our various uh, groups that we have today? That's not, again, to say that all distinctions are erased, but it's to say that we are all united in one body, in one Christ. Again, we see uh, this, this peace of God flows downstream from God to us, then into our, into our relationships with others. Verse 16, and he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Uh, so through the cross, we are first and foremost, we are primarily reconciled to God. That is the, that is the, the primary thing that's going on here, but the result of being reconciled to God is being unified with God's family, being unified with the body of Christ, with the church. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who are near. Again, Christ who is called our peace is the one who, who preaches peace to us. Again, both to Jews who were near and Gentiles who were far off. It is the same, the same Savior, the same blood of Christ that saves both. It's the same blood that makes us the family of God. And because of this peace, we are at peace with one another. For through him, we both have access to one spirit in the Father. Again, we, Jews and Gentiles, have access to the very, the same, the one Father through the same spirit. And this is all accomplished through the blood of Christ. So I hope you kind of see in the, in the shadows here, we see the, the workings of the Trinity. We see the workings of, of all three uh, persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all at work building this, building this church, saving people, bringing unity. Uh, again, the, the theme of unity here, look at how many times it says one, just in, these, in, in 14 to 18. Uh, Christ has made us both one and has broken down the wall of hostility. He might create in himself one new man in the place of two, might reconcile us both to God in one body. For the theme, uh, for through him, we both have access to one spirit, in one spirit to the Father. So again here, this is a, this is a major theme. Don't, don't miss that. Don't miss the emphasis of unity. And it's not, a, it's not a forced unity. It's not just a bunch of people getting together uh, who have the same values or, or something like that. No, this is something that's, um, that's driven by God's grace. As God saves people, he is then building this. He is building this church. He's building us together as one, one people. A couple points of, of application on these, uh, these first several verses here. First one is just to, uh, to be at peace. 
Uh, if you're saved, you are already at peace with God. So I encourage you to think, how, how can I let this peace flow into my relationships with others? Uh, that is what, uh, maybe there's offenses that you're carrying that you need to lay down. Something else is, is a sort of a means of, of self-reflection is if, if you are a Christian who's constantly at odds with other Christians, that should give you pause. Uh, that shouldn't be the, the normative experience of, of a Christian among their, their church family. Uh, that's not to say that we don't struggle. There aren't, there aren't difficult times and, and hard things. Uh, certainly we know that there, is, uh, there can be much adversity, but ultimately we are called to be at peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ, with our church family. We are called to uh, forgive one another, to be long-suffering with one another, to think of others as better than ourselves, to submit to one another. Again, this is, this is all something that flows from the peace of God, which has been poured out to us. As we look at, uh, we'll move on to verses 19 and 20 here. We see, again, just this theme of becoming God's family and also becoming God's temple. Uh, I love just the, the many analogies, the different aspects that Scripture will, will show many times of the same thing. Think about it this way. Okay, now think about it. It's like this. Uh, thinking back to like Jesus' parables of, uh, of the kingdom. It's kind of like this. It's also kind of like this. And he's, he's presenting different angles here. Uh, but verse, verse 19 here, So then, because of this, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and the members of God's household. So because of this, because of the grace of God, because of the blood of Christ, we who were far off have been brought near. Uh, we have access to the Father. We are citizens of God's kingdom. We are members of God's household. Again, that the fact that we are now members of God's kingdom, members of God's household, means that before this, before this grace, we were not. This is something that is, this is, something that is new. This is not our default state. It's something that we are brought into. And this should have a massive impact on how, how it is we think about the church, both our, our local church and the church, uh, the, the universal church. Um, the church is not only our um, brothers and sisters to whom we are covenantally bound, but the church is also God's family. Um, if, if we're concerned with how our family is treated, how much more is God concerned with how his family is treated? Again, that's something that I, I think we can tend to just, just sort of overlook. We, uh, many times it's a temptation to just treat, treat church or treat church family kind of cheaply. Like, oh, there's you know, hundreds of churches within, within a couple miles of here. So what is it that makes any, anyone special? But how do we treat God's family? It's incredibly important. Um, the, the church is, is not something that is optional for the Christian. The church is, is being part of the family that we are called into when God saved us. God saved us to be part of this family. He brought us in. What is it that he brought us into? To his family, to his kingdom, to his household. That's, that's what this is. The church is a, is a covenant people. Uh, that, that's something that we're, we're kind of looking at, and I'm, I'm really thankful for the, the themes that we've looked at in Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, obviously, the, the context is extremely dif different. It's sometimes difficult to, uh, to sort of relate to, uh, to what that is, but I think, um, I think it's really evident just how, uh, how important the theme of being God's covenant people is. Yes, it, it may look different on, on different sides of the cross to some degree, but it's still, it's the same people. That's, you know, as we read Ezra and Nehemiah, that's our family history. Um, that's those who came before us, those to whom we are united. Part of what it means to be a covenant family, just part of what covenant entails, is covenant entails a mutual responsibility and a mutual seeking for the good. Uh, that is, uh, the church whom you are in covenant with is tasked with seeking and fighting for your good. But that also means that you are responsible to seek for that for your neighbor, for those who, who are in the church. It's not just on the church to serve you, it's on you to serve the church. There's mutual responsibility there. We seek the good of one another. That's part of what it means to be a covenant people. Verses 20 and 21 here talks about this, this people that is built. Then it says that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together 
grows into a holy temple of the Lord. So we see here a little bit of a, of a shake-up of which analogy we were using. Uh, now, we, are th- we, we went from thinking of the church as a family, we're now thinking of the church as a temple. Again, we're looking at the same thing, it's just it's a different analogy, it's a different perspective. Um, what's incredibly important here is to note that God is the one doing the building. Uh, so we see here Christ as the cornerstone supporting the foundation, then the foundation is there, the apostles and the prophets, and then upon that we have 2,000 plus years of church history that we are a part of. Um, a thing that we're, we're connected to. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be studying some of those first few centuries coming up in, in a couple weeks on Wednesday nights. Um, so make, a, make an earmark of that. That's, that's going to be an exciting, uh, exciting study. Again, we're, we're looking at family history. Uh, we're looking at how uh, God built his church, how God built his people. But seeing, seeing this, seeing, uh, again, this building, this temple, um, this, this should also fundamentally impact how we think about the church. Uh, One of the big things is the fact that the church is created by God. The church is not something that is created by man. This is another thing that's that's contrary to much modern thinking. You you think of sort of the the, the Christian movement that was really popular a couple years ago, that I love Jesus but hate religion um, kind of thing that's very, very prevalent in our our culture today. But it's just, it's very common to to say things like that, right? Like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. I love, uh, you know, sort of the universal church, but I'm not really really plugged in anywhere. I don't really see a whole lot of value in uh, the local local assembly. I've even heard many professing Christians say that they think the church was just sort of this accident of history. Um, like, okay, Jesus came and, you know, intended to give us this message, and then the church is just something that was kind of an afterthought. It just sort of formed uh, on its own. Uh, that's not the case. Um, God intended to have this. God has been building it for thousands of years. Church fellowship is something that is that is instituted by God. And it's something that is, it is presupposed in that that there is Christian fellowship. Um, I can think of few greater things that have been more of a blessing in my life than fellowship with God's people. Um, that's something that God has, God has gifted us with. That's God's gracious gift. Um, Men can create various, uh, you know, social clubs and fraternities and, and, and all sort of things, you know, trying to, trying to unify people. And, you know, certainly with, with some success, you know, you can, you, you can bring people together for different things. But, um, but that's different. The church is different. The church is not just a couple people with like, um, like ideas coming together. Um, the church is something that, that God has created. It's something that he is, he is building. He is built through the blood of Christ. Verses 21 and 22 here, talking of the temple, and it says, In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We are the temple of God. Um, one, One thing to point out there is that when Scripture speaks of the temple of God, when it's talking about people, it's not so much talking about you as an individual, it's talking about us as a group. It's, it's plural. We are the body, the body of God. We are the, uh, the dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of God. Um, you know, I, I, I guess I just heard people kind of make the argument that, oh, well, it's talking about, you know, your body's a temple and that kind of thing. It's really sort of about your personal cleanliness or, or something like that. That's not really what, uh, what we're getting at here. We are the temple. We are the place where God's spirit dwells. And, uh, and I want to zoom out a little bit out of Ephesians here and just kind of trace this, this theme a little bit through scripture, this theme of the dwelling place of God. Um, if we go back to the, back to the beginning, back to Genesis we see the Garden of Eden, this place where God dwelt, this place where God walked with man. Uh, there There was unity there between God and man in the garden until man sinned. Until man sinned, and, and one of the, probably the biggest primary consequence was the expulsion from the presence of God. And, uh, and, and what we really see here is we start to see in, uh, in Genesis after this, we see this, this darkness that comes after, after man sins. 
Um, and then we start to see this little crescendo. Uh, we start to see the presence of God start to pop up, and we see it expand. And uh, what, what I mean is looking at uh, like Genesis 15, when God comes to Abraham, God appears as a smoking pot and a flaming torch to Abraham. Uh, so we, we see this, this image of this is the place where God's spirit dwells. Now we know, of course, God is uh, omnipresent. God is in all places. But there's also uh, a sense in much of scripture where God is somewhere in a special way, in a unique way. Um, and we, we see that again, beginning in Genesis 15, where God comes as a smoking pot and a flaming torch. Uh, we see, uh, furthermore, still in Genesis, we see when God calls Moses, um, God appears in the burning bush. To Moses. He says, the ground you're standing on is holy ground. It was holy because God was there in a special way, in a unique way. Uh, we see, uh, continuing the, the narrative with Moses, that God's presence was there in the pillar of fire and the cloud as he led his people out of Egypt. Again, there's, it's, just, it's, it's kind of crescendoing. It's, it's not just something where one person's seeing anymore. Now you have this whole, the whole assembly of Israel is seeing God's, God's presence here. We see uh, God's presence then in the tabernacle that he instruct, instructed them to build, um, this place where God's spirit would dwell. We see in increasing in glory, we see the temple that Solomon built, this great, grand, glorious place where the presence of God would, would come in. And then we see in uh, the temples destroyed, we see a second temple is built. That's kind of what we're, what we're getting towards in, uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah. We're sort of getting to that era. And then in the New Testament... God comes and dwells with us, not as a spiritual presence, but as a person. We see in John chapter 1, the Word took on flesh and dwelt among us. Dwelt as tabernacled. He tabernacled among us. The eternal Son, the second person of the Trinity, condescended. That is, he, he stooped down, he took on flesh, and the presence of God was there with us physically, with his people physically, in a, in a unique way, in a way that it had not been before. And, uh, and we, we tend to, I think, a lot of times think of, think of that as sort of the climax of God's presence. And um, if we're honest, we, I think, I, I know I'm many times tempted to think that, you know, if only Jesus was still with us here physically, wouldn't we be better off? Like if we had him that we could, you know, kind of listen to or have him disciple us or, or something like that, we'd, we'd be better off. Um, but scripture says otherwise, <laughs> Uh, Jesus said otherwise. John chapter 16, uh, Jesus said that it is better that he left so that the Spirit could come. So we see Jesus at the end of his earthly ministry, ministry ascends to heaven, the presence of God then leaves, and then a short time later comes down the Holy Spirit and fills his children. We see that at Pentecost and, and several other places uh, through Acts. And, and of course, we see that in the continued building of the church today. We see, again, the Spirit of God saving people through the blood of Christ. God's presence has then been expanding over the last several thousands of years as he's been calling and, and saving and, and redeeming a people uh, unto himself. Again, a people made of, of every tribe and tongue from every age. It's important to remember that this is, again, this is something that God is doing. This is not something that we're doing. As we, as we look around the room, recognize that, you know, I, I, I want you to see in your brothers and sisters in Christ that that is God's handiwork. Uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ is something that God has built, something that God has redeemed. It is the work of God. A couple points of application on this. First one is self-examination. Um, Right? What does our, our relationship with God look like? And many times you can tell what the relationship with God looks like by what does the relationship with our, uh, our church look like? What, is the, what does the relationship look like with the members of God's household look like? The other members of God's temple. How do, we, how do we look at the church? Do we see it as just sort of a, a social club or, or a group of friendly people who, who gather for, for an hour a week? Or do we see it as a family who has been bought by the blood of Christ? I dare say that this is not the, not the common view among the, the broader church as a whole. Um, I, I hope this is not how we look at it here, but I, I say this as, as a way to, to encourage you. Um, May we remember uh, as we look at this that we were once far off. We were under God's wrath. We were on the path to destruction, but Christ redeemed us. Christ reconciled us. May we remember that. And may that remembrance 
stir in us a, a burning desire, a, a supernatural desire, a uh, supernatural love for, uh, love for the church, a love that results in this, this unity that we speak of, this unity that in John says that that's what causes the unbelieving world to believe, is seeing the unity that we have in Christ. May we see that. May we display to the unbelieving world a God who is, who is holy, a God who is love, a God who is peace. A couple very uh, applicable points from this. Uh, invite somebody over for dinner. Grab coffee with somebody. Uh, to have union with this body, um, you, you must first know the members of the body. It's, it's really hard to have union with someone who you don't really know. Um, so that, that's just means of, of practical encouragement. Again, we are, all, we are all here on the same team. We're all in the same body. Um, we are all redeemed by Christ. To have union with the body, you must, you must know the body. And then my last point of application is just for any who are here who do not know this Christ, Turn to him. Come, come talk to us. We would love to talk to you. Anybody you see on stage, anybody whose picture is on the wall out there, please uh, don't leave without, um, without coming and talking to us. Um, but I pray that this was, this was an encouragement. Um, so much of the New Testament is so, um, just, just as we look at the application, it's okay. Here's the thing that is true. Believe it and then live this way in response to it. I pray that that, is, that that is what we can do today, that we would remember these things that are true, remember these things that are true about the church, and that we would then live in a way that is consistent to that, live in a way that honors God consistently with those truths. Well, Father, I thank you for the blood of Christ. Lord, I thank you for, uh, for bringing us near, Lord, for the forgiveness of sins. I, I thank you for uh, just, a, just a special time to, uh, to gather and, and do uh, the Lord's Supper and to do a fellowship meal after, uh, after service this morning, Lord. Thank you for those things. Thank you so much for um, the saints that you have gathered here this morning. Um, Lord, forgive us for the times that we, have, that we have not treasured you or treasured the church as much as we should. Um, thank you for, for the church body that you've placed us in. Lord, I pray that you would just, um, that you would give us, give us increased more and more unity, more and more grace. Lord, give us uh, just a, a supernatural love for one another. Lord, in all things, I pray for your uh, continued grace. I pray that you would be uh, honored and glorified with our worship this morning, um, that you would draw us near to you, and that you would use us as a light to the world. In Christ's name we pray.